You're listening to the Dental Guys, associates, colleagues, or slave labor. How to do associateship right with Kevin Cleishan. Are associates our equals or are they below our pay grade? Kevin Cleishan comes on to discuss this and to discuss really what does mentorship look like in a dental practice? Are we doing it right or do we have it all wrong? This week on The Dental Guys. When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, cavicide and cavi wipes are the first things that come out of our minds. It's automatic and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The dental guys trust Kerr products in our offices and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. Well, we are back with the Dental Guys podcast. I'm John the Dental Guy. And I'm Wes the Dental Guy. And this is a great episode, Wes, to start to bring in. I'm not going to ruin it quite yet, but we've got Kevin Quishan back on. What a great guest he has been over the years. He's been one of our first and longest lasting or longest standing guest who's really he's brought lasted. a lot of value I mean, he's lasted really last and stood. Through the dental he's guys. been with us thick and thin he has always brought some of the best but you know when we start to talk about associateship and we start to talk about you know what you do in your practice when you want to grow when you want to change a lot of it is defining who you are in your practice and Wes you you've been doing some interesting things to kind of redefine that as you grow and build in your practice, um, adding value, adding, uh, kind of defining or redefining what that looks like in your practice. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, uh, we really have, even recently, John, um, we're getting ready to have a meeting uh, to redefine our vision. Um, Mm. My vision has changed, and vision, as you know, from one of our friends at Spear, Amy Morgan, is what is your vision for your team and your business? And that's something that can really change as you're changing your business shape and the landscape really of your business is kind of changing. Um, And the landscape has changed for me. I mean, I've moved from um, a a cottage-based dental practice with a sole uh, dentist practicing with one and a half hygienist to, um, and really mostly fee for service dentistry to Mm -hmm. now I've grown the practice into what it is today, which is a part-time associate and really ready to turn on full time. Just that is, and maximize the amount of space that I'm in doing Mm -hmm. the same type of dentistry, but, uh, now mentoring, right? Yep. And really having to relook at the vision of the practice. Yes. And, when, and yes. when you do that, John, when you do that, when you challenge really your own ideals, right, mm-hmm. and what you're truly about, and you surround yourself with people that are really there for you and hold you to a certain um, thing that they see is really going to help you grow your business, right? Yep. That's key because as a dentist, I can let certain things get in the way, right? That could impact, oh, yeah. right? How I do grow. And I need to hear from people that aren't like me, right? Um, My manager right now, her personality is different than mine, right? Yes. And and my business advisor, his 
background is way different than mine. And the people that are pushing me um, mm. are are helping form me into what the next level is, right? And so uh, this has been a journey for me. You know that. I mean, for me, it's, I mean, I'm still as passionate about like practice as ever. I mean, we can sit here and talk shop about all kinds of things, but nope. I've had to get out of the way in some aspects of my practice so that mm. I can move forward. Right. I mean, sure. Uh, one sure. of the books I'm reading right now is called traction. It was written almost 10 years ago and, uh, get a grip on your business. It's fantastic. Mm. Um, and so I'm super excited about it. You know, we're building a building right now. Um, one of the things that like we talked about in the last show is being able to really like, again, get out of the way Right. Yep. And th- me getting out of the way of a building being built, it was hiring a project manager. Right. And my background um, during, you know, growing up was in construction and even into my early 20s. And so that that was that that's hard for me. Right. And I do walk down there and take pictures and do social media posts and things like that. But I really have gotten out of the way so that. Yeah. And I think that that. That is the whole kind of thing with this discussion, right, is getting out of the way is hard. When you are a Mm. control freak, as many of us business owners are, let's just be honest, right? We are good when we can control things. But then you start to get to a business size and shape where you can't control everything. And you know that you have to, you either have to hit that wall and back off or you have to hit that wall and push through it, get over yourself, realize there's people that know things differently and better than you, realize that you can delegate some of the things that are better yeah. delegated out, and realize that you should focus on the things you're best at and let the people who are best, best at other things do those things. And I think that that is the thing. You're hitting that hard. I also have hit some of those walls over the years. You know, I... I needed to learn and I'm not perfect at it, but I'm learning more and more and more that there are people that are better at things than I am and that I need to figure out what I'm best at, what I'm passionate about. And I know how hard that is. People are like, oh, you say that, right? You say that. And it's just not really true. Well, that go read the E-Myth. Go read it. And I'm not just saying that. I don't recommend very many books, but go read it. The idea that you can do everything well Impossible. in your business is is not true. It is a lie that we've been sold by a lot of people who believe that the, the goal of an entrepreneur is just to work yourself to death. Well, no, it turns out it's not. It turns out there's ways to figure out the place in your business that you fit the best and let the people that do the other things better than you do those things and truly let them loose. And that's where you really see growth in a major way. So, you know, Wes is in that with the building. I'm in that with looking for an associate. And how timely is this episode of talking about associate mentorship, what it looks like to be a mentor, what it looks like to be an associate, what it looks like to be a colleague. Kevin Weishan is about to bring the heat as he always does. And we're excited to get to take where both of us are in our world and our practice and our lives and get to be challenged by Kevin to get better. So after a quick word from our sponsor, we're going to bring you Kevin Quishan. We're going to talk about mentorship, associateship, what it should look like, what it shouldn't. Stay tuned. It's just a moment for a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbrand with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Contrary to popular belief, Proper exit planning is a years-long endeavor, requiring lots of hard work, evaluation, and adjustments. From the moment you open your practice, you should begin working toward your exit. Studies show that most small business owners have around 80%, 80%, get that, of your network tied up in your business. Meanwhile, only about 15% of businesses are actually sold. That means that 80% of business owners are left high and dry when it comes to their retirement. What are you gonna do to prevent yourself from becoming a statistic? For more information about this and other dental-related topics, 
Visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, thank you so much for that message from our sponsor. And this is always a treat to have Kevin Quishan on the Dental Guys podcast. Um, He's been a longtime fan and friend. I like to call him a fan of the Dental Guys. And And I like to just really tell the story, John, again, of our angst, right, of asking Kevin, who was the first, actually, no, the second, I'm sorry. He was the first, like, maybe, like, major guy. That yeah. we got like the balls enough to even ask to talk True to story. a couple of guys. True story, right? It took Jeff Lineberry, right, a friend, to actually tell us, like, look, you can ask Kevin. He's not yeah. going to kill you. Like, he's a pretty cool guy. Right. He's and a he probably cool won't yell at you. So if you think he might, you know, be okay on the show, he's a little different, but I think you'll like it. I like what Kevin brings to the podcast, John, because there's always something we're not expecting, right? And if you go back, if you go back to the first time that we interviewed Kevin Quishan, he said some things that were very awesome about education. I'm not even going to say what he said because you're going to have to go back and listen to that about what's going on in dental education. It's episode like, it's like a hundred episodes ago. Yeah, but it's Which still is true today. It's amazing. Still true today. It is. It is. It's evergreen content, Wes. It is evergreen. Kevin Quishan with the evergreen content. <laughs> so, without further ado, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Dental Guys, <laughs> Kevin Quishan. Uh, you know what? I want that recorded, and I want to wake up to that every day. That, like, I am. I don't usually blush. I don't. I don't. I do. You know, I don't believe on putting people on pedestals. I don't believe on, um, in um, exclusivity. I don't believe in expertise. Really, I think we're all in it together. And so, but that was sure as hell fun to listen to. So, um, so yeah, well, uh, thank you. It's um. I uh, thank you. Thank you. It's not. It's it's not true. I am just a normal person. So is everybody else, in my opinion. Um, That's right. It's just what we do with it. So it's good. tell um, us a little well, bit about what's going though, on. Sometimes, though, you're able to take and distill mm. what you've learned and put it into a 45 minute conversation. And that's one of the things that we appreciate. Yeah. That is one of the skills you have. Not everybody does have a skill, it turns out. So it was something that definitely made a an impact on us. And so you know, we've, we've gotten some great feedback from our listeners over the years, really. Uh, hey, you mm-hmm. know, we'd like to see more of what Kevin thinks about this and what Kevin thinks about that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is something that uh, we've looked forward to for a while. And this is, this is kind of a different conversation because we've talked a lot with you over the years about education and kind of how we, we've talked about, we've talked about a lot. We've talked about how we deal with, you know, we were, we were together during covid we talked about mental health. We talked about, you know, strength in your practice and how to lead your practice. And we talked about how to, you know, facilitate the next step in your practice. But this is kind of part of that. And and that is, you know, many people, I think, and, and, and we don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, although maybe we will. But, you know, things are obviously changing again in the world of dentistry because maybe somewhat of covid that we have some changes in how people view where they begin in dentistry, whether that is going into corporate, whether that is joining a DSO practice, whether that is associating. And, you know, there are people selling their practices. There are people that are maybe looking to expand their practices. And Wes and I have had this conversation over the years of, you know, what does it look like when you want to think about bringing an associate into your practice? You know, what is that about? What, And and obviously you've had a ton of experience with practices that are going through various transitions because a lot of times I would guess that's why they're calling you is they're saying, you know, I'm I'm kind of trying to figure out what's next and, and tell us a little bit about some of the things that people tell you or, or some of your observations about why do people look for an associate? When should they look for an associate dentist? What are some of the things that, that the questions they should be asking to see if this is, 
the next step for them? Hmm. You know, we can talk, it's a great, great question, great conversation, and we can use real examples. You know, I have to uh, change the names to protect the innocent. Um, but literally um, just this morning, I had uh, my first call with an oral surgeon who is looking to bring on an associate to eventually take over. And this is a quite a well-known oral surgeon that a lot of us actually know. Um, and he, he has to coach him just on making sure he's making the right decision about the associate and not, not making such an emotional decision and to help him make sure. And that was a different one for me, but I, I was excited for it. We had, we literally had our first call this, this morning. Um, and, and I mean, and it, it was, I can share with you some of the things we talked about this morning. Um, another practice um, in Oregon um, is literally this week, the 20 something, 20 next week, 23rd is bringing on an associate. And we've been working with him to bring her on for quite a while. And she has actually been out of school a few years. So she's that one. And then there's another practice um, who's just bringing on an associate that is fairly new. There's another practice that's bringing on an associate to help run a brand new satellite practice. Um, and these are all ones that are going on like as we speak. Um, tons going on right now. And so they all have their different stories. A lot of people think that it's time to bring on an associate because their schedule is full, or they think that it's time to bring on an associate because they're tired of being alone, or they think it's time to bring on an associate because they heard that's what you're supposed to do when you're successful and I, I want to feel successful. So I guess I should bring on an associate um, there. I mean, the, the list goes on and um, and oftentimes, sadly, I won't say they're mistaken. It just hasn't been well thought out and it becomes a difficult process. Um, so, so all of those are reasons to the, the reason you want to is is to is a calculated reason to think ahead of time what you want how you want to feel in your practice how you want your team to feel in your practice how you want to feel when you go home how you want to feel when you walk in the office how you want to feel when you look at your schedule for the upcoming month or six months for me that's the beginning of a conversation about if and when you should bring on an associate and then of course you get to well when is the right time and how do i know it's going to work how do i know how many days how do i know it's going to be successful how do i change my schedule how who gets the new patients then you get into all of the all of the logistics about it right which is a whole different conversation so um i don't know if i even answered that question yet but, yeah i think um, the the thing that i hear in this is there seems to be you're bringing a lot of emotion, right, to the mm -hmm, decision. Mm -hmm, and um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I ask why, right? Why is mm -hmm, there so mm -hmm. much emotion in this mm -hmm. decision? You know, I, I tend to be, uh, when you look at personality traits, more of the feeler type. Um, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm going to have <clears throat> that need, right, to, mm -hmm. especially when mm -hmm. I show up and I look at my schedule for the next six weeks or six months mm -hmm. that I'm going to feel good about who mm -hmm. I'm working with. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. no fault to John, but juxtaposed to this, no joke. The other side of the dental guys is, is a little, is different. Um, almost, mm -hmm. almost not 180 degrees, but, but a definite flip side of the coins, you know, on our podcast from the difference between right. someone that is not as feeler concerned. So why is it that you're spending a lot of times talking and asking about, Hey, how do you, how do you want to feel? What's what, what's the reason yeah. behind that question? Yeah. Well, even for, you know, for you, Wes, it would be, it's not like it's easier. It's just, it connects with you easier. <laughs> and maybe the conversation goes in a slightly different direction for somebody like John, who's far more analytical and strategically based than feeling. What does it look like in my practice? What's it gonna be with my practice? That's just as important. However, the feel 
I think it's important to come in there, um, but you come at it a couple different ways. My conversation with you, Wes, would be way different from from John. Mine, mine from John would be, you know, like for instance, this morning. I'll go with this morning's conversation because um, he is a very successful oral surgeon um, who is very much um, well. He's he's very motivated. Let's just say and. Um, you know, I started with him with, I actually um, had him take the, the why, in fact, I think um, the, the, from the why Institute, you know, why do you get out of bed every day? What is it that gets you out of bed every day? And, and can we make sure that we, that we support that? And that's not, that's, that's getting you to the feel part, right? Because if we don't continue to support why you get out of bed every day, you bring in an associate and you're destined for failure. And then, yep. like I, I did this morning, we it's it's narrowing down you know for me it's people use it all the time it's, but it's whether you use it use it or not which is what are his we we took his top 10 core values narrowed it down to six and narrowed it down to three and said are what happens when those core values are being threatened judged um or or challenged how can we make sure that those top three core values are being supported and nurtured and this morning, it's interesting because we realized with his, his were um, um, autonomy, knowledge, and emotional well-being. Mm. And he knows that when he brings on this associate, that his autonomy and potentially his and his emotional well-being during the transition will be challenged. Well, that's okay. You know that we talked about it. It's it's a it's a it's a race. You're like, I know it's going to be over. Then I will get more of that back. But he also knows that his one of his top three core values are knowledge. And if this associate is not bringing this desire for knowledge and and learning, that 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 won't be fun for him either. So those aren't so those things bring on feeling. How do you want it to feel? What's it going to be like if your why is not being supported and your top three core values are not? And then what are what are the what is the associate's why and top three core values? And we better make sure that they're being supported also. So then that does describe how you're going to feel when you are, mm. when you walk in every day, are you excited to go in or not? If you're, if your why and top core values are being challenged, threatened, judged, not supported, my guess is you're not going to walk in as an eight or a 10, or if you do, you're sure as heck about to walk out as a three or a four at the end of the day, you're going to be exhausted. And that's not how you want to feel. The human resources side of this is obviously <clears throat> grand especially when it comes from a, uh, you know, how we hire people today in society. Um, mm -hmm. You know, personality tests um, just graze the surface. Some are great, some are poor. There are some that are mm -hmm. very amazing. They're amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. just about every personality test will open and unlock something about you that mm -hmm. could be useful in this situation. Are you utilizing uh, personality mm -hmm. test in for the person that's looking for the job and also mm -hmm. for the people that are actually trying to employ the associate and team members. I'm a, you know, it's funny, a lot of in the corporate world or any coaches or consultants, facilitators, whatever you want to call them, they'll use, you know, disc Myers Briggs, Kearsay, Enneagram or Enneagram, um, or people styles at work, Bolton, Bolton wrote that book. It's, it's what you do with them. Um, and not just doing it for fun because, Oh, look at yours. And now that, and so for me, I'm, I've, you know, I, I grew up, um, with Kearsay and Myers Briggs that there's 16 different, um, combinations that are possible and how you break those down and look at them. And they're spectacular. Um, I've used disc before, which is basically, that's pretty common. We're using four different quadrants and that's basically the same as people styles at work. Um, and that's, that's sort of my go-to because you can go down a lot of paths with it, paths with it, but it's not overcomplicated. Um, and then a couple of practices that do the Enneagram, which is really spectacular as well. So for me, I will, I'll mix and match a little bit. But, but absolutely. So to answer your question, Wes, yes. And with the team, right? I mean, how close do you um, think that this discussion or decision is based on almost in the way of <laughs> similar to any relationship, whether it's dating or marriage? I mean, when you're talking about bringing someone on as an associate, it almost sounds like what we're talking about is 
is a relationship. I mean, do you, yeah. I mean, is that is yeah. that really? I mean, yes. Maybe maybe I'm yes. maybe entering into a world where I'm a little foreign. You know, Wes is like, oh, he's not a feeler. I, you know, I I. <laughs> It's not that I, I actually have, have dove into that big time. I have a big Enneagram book actually right back on my bookshelf because oh, oh nice. like I, I, I know that that's super, I mean, do you feel that this is a similar discussion where you kind of need to know what you, what works with you and your team when yeah. you're actually yes. asking yes these yes. questions? Is that the question you ask back to people? Yes and yes. And in fact, this morning, so yes, I think I, it is, you're in relationship, like you're in relationship with your team, you're in relationship with your associate, your associate, you know how I feel. I feel like it's, they're all just as important. I do. I feel like that. But there's, but for some reason, people put more emphasis on the associate. Um, I think you're married to the rest of your team, just like you're married to your associate. I think you're in relationship, but, but today on the, on the call this morning, Literally, we were we were just having so much fun and talking about the associate and, and creating a persona for the associate and things. And, and then all of a sudden he goes, well, this is pretty much like the five love languages, isn't it? And I go, <laughs> we can use that one, too, if you want. Yes, that's exactly what it is. So that's what he yep. said today. He's like, it's like the five love languages. Yep, Yeah, let's go with that one. If that one if you're familiar with that one, let's play with that one for a few minutes. So so, yeah, it is. It is, John. It's it's exactly um it's you're in relationship. So it depends on how you want to deal with your relationship. Yeah. A, lo a yeah. lot of, um, is what, what's going to happen, right? Once the associate arrives mm -hmm. and I feel like yeah. you've described several situations, most of those being a young, uh, dentist, uh, one mm -hmm. to two years out of school in a lot of these situations that you're dealing with currently. And mm -hmm. I wonder you know, how many of those one to two year out of school uh, dentists, doctors mm -hmm. are looking mm -hmm. to be um, mentored, right? Mentored, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that, are they, are, is that what they're asking for, right? What, mm -hmm. what would you say about that? Are they asking mm -hmm. for that? Mm -hmm. Some are directly asking for it and and as is I and I work with both parties and even if they don't directly ask for it, one of my questions to them is, what are your hopes to continue your growth and your learning? And how does that look for you at the office? So I don't say, how do you want to be mentored? I will change the verbiage a little bit. But really, then we start to talk about, oh, well, I would love, you know, to learn more about this and that. Oh, OK. Don't you think it'd be great if we had a conversation with the dentist about how that would look for you in the practice? So really setting up a, a very individualized, customized men mentorship. But certainly it is um, some it's always has to do with comp for the one to two to three years out. It's always about complex treatment planning. It's always mm -hmm. about. Sometimes it becomes about verbiage with patients, but they don't know that in, it right away, but it ends up being part of that. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it's the, the big cases, treatment planning, um, but, but something more always comes out of it. But, but yes, but, but being an intentional mentor, Wes, is, um, it's a big deal. And when you, when you come at it with some intention, it can be pretty successful or when you ignore it, the odds are certainly not in your favor anyway, right? It's probably yeah. not going to go so well. So what do you think that the attitude overall from the associate, I mean, what we're seeing, you know, with the, with the way the landscape is changing, you know, we're obviously seeing a, a push more, it seems like, toward a group practice mentality. You know, there are mm -hmm. fewer, not, not of course, exclusively, but there are fewer people going into solo practice than before. There are fewer owner doctors as a, as a trend. There are more people wanting a group practice of some type, whether that be, you know, a DSO model, whether that be a corporate model, whether that be an associateship model. Uh, how do you determine in a young dentist what they want because obviously this is a i don't i don't know that these conversations are happening you know i i think mm -hmm. that a lot of the time what we're encountering is it's more of a hey you know we have a i have a job 
opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, let's talk a little bit about the type of practice that, you know, you, you maybe, maybe I'm going to give you an opportunity to just kind of talk a little bit about your philosophy about mm -hmm. congruency and happiness in your life and work. And this is, I know people that haven't maybe listened to Kevin before don't really understand what we're talking about. So I want to give you an opportunity to maybe talk about that. And how does that impact your way of approaching this discussion of bringing someone into your practice and talking about what they really want and how mm -hmm. that, how that influences your onboarding and your decision making and your relationship building and what are you trying to create because i think many times it's a job and unfortunately mm -hmm. that's creating this sort of commodity mindset the dentist is a dentist is a dentist a crown is a crown is a crown and mm -hmm. obviously that's fine if that's your model i suppose but you know dental guys mm -hmm. our whole idea has always been okay so let's take you know, you know, this to the next level, you know, what, what is it that you, when someone contacts you and they say, Hey, you know, this is, I need, I need your help. You know, mm -hmm. what are you talking to them about? Why do they, why do they look at that? And what is, how does that come back to this discussion of, you know, how do you keep that happiness model that, 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 you know, congruence model in a practice mm -hmm. when you're bringing someone in and trying to implement some complete, completely new change with an associate in the practice. That's a huge question, but I just feel like we're seeing this, <laughs> we're seeing this question. whole focus of like just a job, you know, it's just mm -hmm. eight to five, you go home and you have a beer, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. how does that, how is that different? How can it be better? And how do people, yeah. you know, how do you tend to, to push people toward what questions to ask yeah. when they're looking yeah. to, to bring this into their practice? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to answer that, but in the first 15 seconds, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are, especially today, um, we're not post-pandemic yet, we're peri-pandemic still, but um, that there are plenty of older associates right now that are taking this opportunity because they're seeing that they don't like their lives or something changed. And I, one practice that I'm working with in Wisconsin has already had an associate that was older that moved from Chicago that just wanted to be farther away from things and is actually older than the um, owner dentist. Um, so that's, that's happening. So we, we do still need to talk about, or we can talk about that. It's not always the younger dentist, but the older dentist is different because they have some experience in dentistry and we know what they can produce and, and how they've been with team members before and what their experience is. The younger dentist doesn't necessarily have that. But to answer your question, the the younger dentist coming in to and, and they do talk about it a little bit like when i was teaching at oregon of course in dental school we have conversations about the benefits of private practice group practice corporate practice dso practice etc but you're spot on we all know you're spot on right now with most most meaning over 50 percent of dentists coming out of school are more worried about having a job and paying their bills than anything else. So even when you start talking about happiness, the first thing you have, you have to meet them where they are, which is survival mode. Yes. If we move, yes. if, if we don't say to them, no, get over that, um, go do this, go do that, then you just blew through them. And that's part of the, the facilitation. It's Oh, so let me let me check in with you. Let me let me say back what I think I'm hearing, which is you you are feeling like you need a job for survival right now. And that corporate is the way for that. Is that what I'm hearing? And where is the story behind that? Where, where Why are you telling yourself that story? Because there are other stories out there. You can you can write your own book if you want. Um, so it, this, the first point is, as a good facilitator, it's just meeting them where they are and being curious about it. Now, your question about happiness, it leads to that because if we meet them where they are and be curious and check in with the things we're hearing and, and what is their model, we call it the, the, um, mindset of, of where this is coming from and, and 
notice that first as opposed to pushing past that and going, no, 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 that's not the way it is. Do this. It's like, oh, so that comes from what you've what you've learned in school or what you saw growing up and meeting them where they are. And then we can we can really start to this gets a little crazy, but not for not for your audience. That's why I love being with you guys. It is helping both the dentist and the potential associate get out of their linear mind. And this is what I've been learning a lot about over the past several years now and integrating more. It's especially as dentists, we are so linear. Let me write down the pros and cons. I need my column, pro, con, this practice, this practice. And then I'm gonna have a set of bullet points as to the things I want. And we're very much in our left brain. If we can get out of our left brain and into our right brain and and almost sense into it what when you think about it how does your body feel when you think about going into this practice notice how your body feels where do you feel the tension what do you notice about your body oh oh that might not be so sustainable and when you put yourself over here in this other practice and sense into it how would that feel and and let your body just go there and notice what your body does oh i now i'm feeling it differently and i feel that this this curled up head down tension is probably not sustainable. And that's not what I want for you. Or now you can make fun of me all you want. We can get into literally, as opposed to putting bullet points down, you can literally grab your pins, crayons, whatever it is, and you draw your current situation and your preferred future. And whether it's shapes and stick figures, proximity, lines to connect it you see it very differently and it allows you to see the disconnect or the possibilities um, and, and then the conversation changes and by default we don't really just talk about do you want to be happy how do you want to be happy you're coming at it from something much deeper than happiness and then you can have the conversation about happiness i don't know if that makes sense to you or if, um but Oh yeah, but I don't always just say, "How do you want to be happy?" It starts much deeper. Then you realize, "Oh, I think that's going to make me happy. That's how I'm going to feel every day." So good. But you've got yeah, to sense into it first. That's right. You know what? You know what you're doing here. Yeah. There's a book by Matthew <laughs> Kelly that I yeah, recently I'm thinking read about a different book. Dream, I love it. Called the Dream Manager, and Ooh. basically, you sit down and you're talking. Right, the book is is really cool. It's written as from a fable standpoint, so it's really easy read. You can read this thing in a weekend, and you might think as you're as an owner dentist reading your book, you're like, man, what am I doing here? Am I managing people's lives and their dreams? And do you know what you're going after though? Is you're going after what people want, right? Mm -hmm. Right, what people yeah. want. What is getting you up in the morning, and what is making yeah. like what makes your day, and what are you working for? Well, right. it, and I think about your comment about this curled up, you know, stress ball situation. Mm -hmm. I think about Amy Cuddy's book, which is all about how, you know, our body language reflects, you know, how we feel, whether it's a position of fear and, you know, withdrawal or a position of power. I mean, it is true. Like you kind of feel when you're talking about this, how, mm -hmm. you know, being in a practice like that would make you feel. And as a, whether it's as an owner or as an associate, you know, this is, you know, what do you really want? What type of practice do you really want? And I think that's, you know, that's really cutting to the, the key points of what we're trying to, to kind of mine into here is, so, you know, if your goal is to punch a clock, then there are practices for you, you know, but is it, but is it really deep down, you know, how, when you really dive into most people's personality and, and you talk about, mm -hmm what they really want. I don't think most people that's really what they truly want. You know, there's a reason for that, whether it's fear, whether it's security, whether it's debt, whatever that might be, you know, there's a, there's a motivation in there somewhere. Um, but Actually, happiness. Can I, and, can I be a, yeah. can I be a bad, a bad guest here and interrupt you for a second? Go, go, go. Um, because I, I, I do when you, when you were talking about the body and that's and you think about how that's going to feel or how, and how you want to be sense into your body oftentimes though John you you may realize that and then if your core, say your core values are wealth emotional well-being and recognition let's just say and 
and and yet you don't want to feel in your and you know that and you're also sensing into your body a little bit and having this vision of how you want to feel but to support all that the step that's going to get you the first step that's going to get you from tight curled up as you said you don't go from here to here right mm. you it, it, there's a step that goes from here to that here would. yeah and that might actually just be because of your core values and why you get out of bed every morning, it might be go into corporate practice because that's going to help your emotional well-being. Wealth is also one of your core values. You may not get some recognition there, but two of your top three core values are being supported. And that is the appropriate step for you to move towards your preferred future. That as opposed to just saying, no, don't, don't go to corporate practice. That's not going to make you feel good. It sensing into it, it, you might learn that that is the appropriate step and, it, and then it doesn't feel so bad. You know, there are some yeah. people, what you're saying, that aren't ready to step into a complete, like, environment of, like, man, this is amazing dentistry. Like, we're doing full no. mouth rehabs and we're learning all this stuff yeah. and we're learning, like, this and that and all these different systems and protocols about how to perform treatment. But in, then yeah. all in the background, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not even recognizing that there are some mm. things over here, right, that really matter most. And you could be trying to fulfill parts of your your body, your your mind with things that don't provide what you really need because you've never asked these questions. Yep. Yeah. And right. how, many people, so, how many people are not asking these questions, right? So let's talk about yeah. that. What are some what are some questions as an owner? that you should be asking yourself mm -hmm. before making this decision? And what are some questions as a potential candidate, an associate, whether you be new or, or not, that you should be asking yourself? You know, talk, talk about that. How, how would you push mm -hmm. someone from either side? What questions should they be asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and we started, we said some of that earlier, which is why do I, where is this conversation coming from? The first time I thought about it, the question I would say is, did you wake up in the morning and just say, I need an associate? No, there was something that happened during your day, or there was a pattern that you were seeing mm -hmm. that made you keep, it came back to your mind again. It came back to your mind again. And, and what, what is that pattern? When did that, when did you notice that thought kept coming up? And it might be simple for some, it's like, no, I'm just, I'm booked. Every day I'm booked six weeks out and busy as heck and I must, must need associate. Okay, so that's the pattern. However, what now what is it that you want it to look like? Because it might be close the filter down a little bit, slow your practice down, up your treatment planning, increase efficiency, have the same revenue, but slow it down. Mm -hmm. Or is it bring on an associate? And so they, they think they want to bring on an associate. So my question is always, what, when, when did you notice this coming up? What is the pattern that this, what are you thinking every time you start thinking about an associate? And what is it that you think is going to happen when you get this associate? Hmm. What is, what is your, what is your vision of what, of how it's going to, how it's going to feel? And is that, is that in connection with how you want it to feel? Because now you've got, maybe more team members, an extra associate, and now you need more new patients, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe that's not, you thought you need an associate, but what you really needed was to slow it down. Mm. Have maybe change the way you do your exams, change the way you treat my plan, start referring things out, do more of what you love to do and be more efficient. Um, so it's a clarity, it's, a, it's, it's helping people get clarity so I really only answered two questions because it depends, John, on where the conversation goes, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have like, here's my 10 questions. It's you answer me this, and then I'm genuinely curious about this, or I feed it back to you and say, yeah. so let me, let, me, let me make sure I'm hearing you right. And so it's more of a, a pattern of facilitation than it is uh, answer these 10 questions so I can figure mm -hmm. you out. Let me, that's a great answer. And let me, let me ask this as kind of a follow up to that. <clears throat> this is maybe changes the game here. And I know we'll, we'll respect your time here and kind of close this out here in a little bit, but how, Sorry. how the other fear I think <clears throat> that keeps owner doctors from bringing associates on is the idea of the revolving door. 
the idea that I'll bring someone in, Every I'll teach months. them, right? <laughs> and then I'll have another, I'll have to go through the same process again. Should, uh, uh, is that a, is that a bad thing when, when that happens? Is, is this something we should be afraid of? Is that something you should accept? Is that something that means that you've done something wrong? Is that part of this process? Uh, talk a little bit about from your experience, you know, what, what, how should we view that? Well, I'm very uh, uh, biased about this. My, the short answer is no, I don't think it's a bad thing, but you have to know for it's, it's, you know, are you a risk averse person? Are you, if again, going back to, to core values, if emotional well-being um, is one of your top values, and let's say, um, gosh, so is so is autonomy, um, and all of a sudden you've got an associate in there, and and they're and they're coming and going, then it, it then maybe it is bad for you. Mm -hmm. But if you realize that's part of it, like in fact, like it was this morning, then maybe it is for you. Now, is, you can have an associate, you know, as Wes said, every 18 months, I love the way you said that, every 18 months, <laughs> right? Well, right. how do you know that a team member is going to be there more than 18 months? That's you exactly don't. what my manager says. You never, you <laughs> you never, never do. Yeah. You never do. Yep. So how are you going to, you can ask them, are you from this community? Or do you have roots in this community? Are you done having, ba you know, all the things you're not supposed to ask. Do I think you're done having babies? Do, does, this, does it feel like you've got a solid marriage, but that you're still going to need money? Um, you know, all these things that sound great. And yet that could all happen, but then they move next week. So my, my short answer is if, something there's always some growth and learning in the process in in wes's 18 months um there's some growth and learning and if you do it intentionally as long as they left your practice somewhat better they've put a positive some, there's some growth something positive happened in those 18 months then the good news is you'll have somebody else come in and, and they will have a positive impact on it. And if that happens every 18 months for your career, that somebody comes and somebody leaves, but they leave it a better place, I, yeah. I'm pretty down with that. As long as you have a a nice on you know corporate onboarding so that it's it's smooth every 18 months, and then they leave it a better place, fine. See, you know? that right there is the backstory key right there. That's the little nugget, right? That is like making that work. It's called systems. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. It's, like, that's one of the things. Systems. it's, it, it's, it's yeah. a bad word, John and, and Kevin, but let me just it's say it's not this. a bad word. I like that if, word. Well, it makes me I feel like very it. comfortable. I know it does. And I love systems too, right? Cause they can be repeatable, refined. And <laughs> Kevin already and called replaced. me out earlier. So, so I'm just going to say, I here's feel the very interesting comfortable thing about that. Yeah. system. Here's the thing about that is that if you do build a system and prepare yourself for that associate to leave, right? Prepare for it, that associate to leave, right? Don't, I mean, yeah. if, I mean, even if you're tied down to him emotionally, like, I mean, I'm, I mean, a hundred percent like in on this guy or this girl, mm -hmm. like we're, this is amazing, right? But in the back of your mind, right? You've got a plan that, that you've built, right? That if they leave, right, you know what you're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. Because that'll, that'll make the sting, not even be a sting sometimes, yeah. and it could be a good thing, right? Susan Jeffers wrote the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, and it's a yeah. short mm. book, but but in one page, it's basically like, realistically, like realistically, what do you think is the worst case scenario? But keep it real, like, you know, they're not mm. gonna burn your place down, like, like yeah. come on, keep it real. What's the worst case scenario? And are you willing to accept that possibility? And are you prepared to handle it? Great. Right. Move on. And by the way, as far as systems go, John and Wes, I, you know, I love them, but that word is terrible. And what I always say, and you'll hear it over and over again is how about if we say, how do you want energy and information to flow optimally with intention through your office? Oh, now, oh we man. can't, we, we can't say that every time, but, Show but title. shorthand because we're going to run out of breath. Right. We are. We're getting around a breath. I so would say, say that systems. every time, actually. I think Dude, I would is, say that. Yeah. I would print that. I would put that I, on a wall somewhere. That might see, go on my wall. Me too. So uh, say it again. It is. 
do, how, you, how... do you know how you want energy and information to flow through your office optimally with intention? I love it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in any way making light. It's, it's so true. It is. It's good. Energy yeah, yeah. and information. And information. And, and, yeah. John, and are you making on my that, bus? And making that clear. Yeah. Yes. I mean, right. I yes. mean, true. get on. I'm yeah. serious. Right. Now that who book is pouring means energy me because, into like, I don't who? Want it. Bad energy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, <laughs> who's pouring energy into who and when and how? And who's responsible for bringing the energy to different mm -hmm. areas of the office as and well information. as information and information. Yes. Yeah. Mm, no, that is, yeah. I mean, that's, that I think is if that's the approach that we can take. And I, and I, and I, I asked that question earlier about associateship only because I, I think we, we that have done this or have been involved with this definitely feel that fear. I think if there is a fear, if you, especially if you're, if you yeah. are risk averse, uh, the yeah. idea of every 18 months and uh, knowing, but this is the thing. This is the, this is not all bad. This is like I say, I, and I think maybe ah, sounds weird, but it's like the more you get along in life, maybe and the perspective that you have, the more you realize those are really the things that matter. Mm. Maybe much more when you do hang up your hat or whatever you want to call it is the impact that you did make on people yep, that you exactly. worked with and how you did create, uh, you know, replace yourself or, you know, mentor someone or bring someone along and, and create a passion in them that they were willing to go out and light a torch somewhere else and maybe do that again. And that's something that we've all experienced, whether it was in school, whether it was through, uh, you know, continuing education, whatever it was, somebody brought us along. Somebody made us want to have this conversation Instead of, you know, at a bar in Chicago with bourbon, it was, you know, on a podcast with, you know, a lot of people listening. And it was because we're, we're really are interested in what does this look like and what have we learned about this? So I think that now in this time, kind of close out to close out the show and with how COVID has changed the landscape and how the baby boomers have changed the landscape and, you know, the current way that we're seeing practices change. How important is it, do you think, for, you know, owner doctors to think about mentorship? Mm. You know, do, do you think that it is a critical time for that? Do you think that maybe there's another approach, again, depending on what people are looking for in their core values? Or do you think that there's a, <clears throat> there's an underlying fear of, what might happen every 18 months that we need to overcome? You know, are, are, do you think that when people really think about what they want, that we could change the landscape of dentistry in a positive way through mentorship? Uh, I mean, I think that's maybe a, sounds like a softball question, but it's, it's yeah, really, yeah. it's a lot, there's a lot more to that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, so I'll, I'll, um, it's not a softball question. I can, we can make it really complex if you want. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the eight, if, to be a mentor intentionally, um, it even it there are things we can do upstream so that it's not always 18 months. There are things, you know, when we say, oh, just get ready for it. You know, oh, if what if it was part of it and you knew that was going to be part of it and I was going to be mentoring somebody different every 18 months and that's just that's just the way it's going to be. Well, there are some things you can do to mitigate that a little bit, right? And if you really do see that it's a pattern, that, that it's a revolving door, yeah, it's a time to take a look inside a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. as, opposed to, as opposed to giving into it, saying, you know what, if I don't want it to be every 18 months, either I don't want to be a mentor and associate, or what could I be doing different on, on this end to, to mitigate that a little bit? There's plenty you can do upstream uh, to, to minimize that pattern. But... Um, so that's that's a you know that's a, another topic as well. But for mentorship, we always you know way back in the day, you know AGD had a mentor program. I think the ADA did. You know everybody was like, find a mentor, find a mentor, find a mentor. Mm -hmm. And you know we've but we've probably all had people come to us and say, you know, oh, I'm looking for a mentor. Wow. My question is always, what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. mm. What, what, what does mentor mean to you? Does it mean sitting down with you once a week and looking at your preps? Does it mean sitting down and just listening to what's going through your brain? Mm. Does, it, does it mean um, going out 
to, you know, and having a, a, a beer with you and just sort of chatting about what happened in your day, what, what does that look like for you? So I think that, yes, we're at a time right now. I think actually, no, I think we've always been at a time. I think it's just how we come to it that maybe it could be different. Because when we think of mentor, it's like, oh, mentor. And then you're either in or you're out. And it seems like I just need somebody to tell me what to do. And that's that's hierarchical. Mm. And it's expert versus not expert. And that's not so safe. Yep. Mm. Or sustainable. Right. And so mm. I, I would look at it very differently as as how can we actually intentionally not have it be hierarchical or expert and just support and I'll let you then I'll let us finish. But the, the going back to the, the surgeon today, the guy he's thinking about bringing in in June of 2022 called him this week. He's on this terrible rotation right now, you know, that the surgeons go through. And this guy's pretty brilliant. And he got the verbally he got the crap beat out of him in a surgery from an attending the other day and and he called up this this surgeon that, that i was talking to today and literally said can i tell you what happened now he could have and that he wanted to talk about it but you can imagine that he could have also not wanted to call him because maybe this the surgeon that's thinking about hiring him would be thinking oh maybe he's not as good right Right. Like he'd be afraid to show his real self, yep. but instead he felt safe enough. That's mentorship. Yes. To call, to call and say, can I tell you, and maybe he didn't screw up the surgery at all, but what if he did? He was like, God, I under pressure. I did this to, to not think, well, now he's not going to hire me. If I, if I be my authentic self, you know, mm. that's, that's, that's mentorship. Yeah. Right so here's, here's the word I love to look, look, use is that I'm not looking for someone to mentor, but I'm looking for someone to compliment me, right, mm -hmm. as the owner, mm -hmm. right? I'm bringing mm -hmm. you on to help compliment me, to actually help me grow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by doing yep. that, um, what you're doing is you're humbling yourself, right? Mm. And that really is probably the most difficult thing to do for a senior doc as well as a new grad coming out trying totally. to always have to prove themselves, right? Oh, yep. And so I, I feel like that this conversation has been amazing, right? As usual, what we learn here is that there's more to um, working with someone, and hiring someone than just the skill set of can you prep, can you talk to people, um, what even what's your personality type, right? It's understanding a whole breadth of things, right? And so one thing that Kevin Quishan does well is he's able to take these complex things that um, are personalities and you know, different things that people want in their life and really pare it down to trying to find out if these things are going to work together like a machine. And right, that's what mm -hmm. everybody wants to show up and go home and fe feel fulfilled and wake up in the morning and be ready to go again. And, you know, everybody wants that. And so one thing that I've always loved about Kevin is when I ask him a question, he most of the time asks me <laughs> one before he answers. Cheers, and so sir. listen, if you, yes, if you're looking for that now, Kevin, I know that you're not here for this, but we do believe in you. You're not paying us in any way. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, you know, we have learned so much from you as a dentist technically and from a standpoint of, you know, personage, we believe as dental guys, and I know Kevin believes this as well, that the way to succeed is to surround yourself with people that are better than you, mm -hmm. that compliment you, that can encourage you, lift you up, and bring energy and information to you that you can, right, disseminate and then receive back from someone else as well. So what does he do, right? And so I've pulled it up right here for you to see right on the YouTube channel. And so uh, you can see that right here. He has a business, right? And it is K-squared 
Yep, facilitation and dental education. In fact, I referred one of my good friends um, that was looking for someone to speak this week um, to yeah. a kind of an all day type thing. And because you know what, that was the first person that came into my mind, right? Someone that could like bring technical things to your table, like teach you things that are technical, high level dentistry, or even just like run of the mill. How do I get along with people? Right. And that's what I like about uh, Kevin Quishan. So if, if you're looking for Kevin and head over to K squared facilitation dot com and send him a message, he'll be I know he'll respond and uh, it'll be great. I want to thank you, Kevin, for being on the show tonight. I thank know you. that you've encouraged a lot of people. And if you have questions for him, please reach out through his website and uh, he'll get back to you. Kevin, I'll just leave you for the Thanks. final word before we sign off. My final word is the guy from Minnesota actually emailed me and um, I, I'm, I'm scheduled up there in like June of 2022. So thanks for the referral. We got <laughs> right on. And, and that was quick. It's funny you said that. We emailed today. Yeah. And uh, my other final word is um, is gratitude. I, um, I, you know, every time we're together, I leave here with my heart full. And that's what's more important to me is feeling yeah. um connected. I, my, my why in this world is to contribute. And when I'm not able to contribute, um, I, it, it, my, I, it's, it's why I wake up in the morning. So thank you for allowing me to contribute to the podcast and to your lives. That's, that's my final word is it goes both ways, guys. You know, it does. Well, gratitude makes all the difference. And listen, if you've really loved and liked listening to the dental guys, we appreciate you listening to that. And we're so grateful that you've joined us today. Listen, one of the ways that you can kind of give back to us is just to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. That's how we get the word out. Uh, really, some of our sponsors have been with us for a very long time, and we appreciate those people. You've heard those people many years throughout the show. Hey, give them a call if you're interested in anything that they've got going on. We wouldn't recommend them unless they really meant something to us. And of course, if you're interested in talking to Kevin more about what he can do to help facilitate what's going on in your life, your practice, whatever that might be, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, scanning for CR bites and what's the latest, greatest in sleep apnea. Kevin has a lot of information regarding those things as well. So we appreciate Kevin being on the show as well. Listen, again, follow us on Facebook. Head us over there at Instagram. Follow us there as well. We're on the Twitter as well. And we're looking forward to many more podcasts just like this um, as we discuss things to help you take it to the next level in your practice. So for Kevin, John, I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys. <laughs>